Today, we're focusing specifically on the force of friction. Until Newton's time, it was believed that a constant force was required for constant motion. This belief held for almost 2,000 years, and it was brought forth by the ancient Greeks. The issue, the way the Greeks saw reality, was this. They believed that constant force was required for constant motion. The reason why is they didn't conceptualize the concept of friction. It wasn't until Newton's time where he completely reinvented the idea of motion. Newton's idea was different than what was the established belief. He believed that the default for motion was two things, either at rest or constant motion in a straight line. And it was an additional force that caused objects to eventually slow down and stop. And he referred to this as the force of friction, which the Greeks themselves never actually thought of as a separate force. If you recall in the last video, we talked a little bit about how he came up with the first law and as a result, how he came up with the idea of friction. And here again is a diagram of this half pipe uh, model. So he uh, had a a ball bearing and it would roll down and then come back to the other side. And when it came back up to the other side, what was noted is that it would reach or at least attempt to reach the same height on both sides. And it didn't matter what the angles were for the steepness. It wasn't about how far it traveled, it was about trying to get back to the original height. Based on this, he then speculated that if the ramp traveled indefinitely, that this object would continue in a straight line forever and ever, unless acted upon by an unbalanced external force, or if it could reach that same height. Of course, in reality, we don't see this happening, and that's where the idea of the force of friction comes into play. So when we talk about friction, there are basically two types of friction. There's something called the static friction, and then there's something called the kinetic friction. Static friction is associated with not sliding, where kinetic friction specifically with sliding. Now, we need to clarify this. When I say static friction has uh, uh, means is associated with not sliding, it's a very odd way to put it. Why sliding? Well, with friction, the, the two types have to do with whether or not the surfaces are coupled together or whether the surfaces slide against each other. And that's the difference. It has to do with sliding. So kinetic friction always involves sliding. Static friction, no sliding. There are two instances where we are not sliding. One, an object is at rest. Or two, an object is rolling. If an object is rolling, it means that the two surfaces aren't slipping against each other. It's when the objects start to slide. For example, if you aggressively apply your brakes, Um, you get the sliding or the screeching of the brakes against the ground. That would be the state of kinetic friction. Where static friction is where the tire is free to roll. The interesting thing to note is that the static friction is greater than the kinetic friction. So what is the symbol here? This symbol is the Greek letter mu, and it represents the relative strength of the force of friction. The larger the mu value, the more friction is generated. Over here, we have a table of some common coefficients of friction. One column is the static, the other one is the kinetic. So again, static is associated with not sliding, kinetic is associated with sliding. And if you take a look, when we look at some of these numbers, let's specifically look at rubber on concrete, um, because that's the closest number that we have to uh, tires on asphalt. The static friction is one, the kinetic friction is 0.8. Well, what do these numbers mean? What we have to do is we have to take a look at the formula here, specifically this force of friction formula. Now, when we look at the force of friction formula, what's important to note is that the force of friction is measured in newtons, and the normal force is also measured in newtons. So this mu has no unit, and it's essentially a ratio. So what are some important ideas about the force of friction? Well, The strength of the friction has everything to do with the nature of the relationship of the two surfaces. So really the best way to explain what's happening with friction is to sort of show a bit of a diagram. Now imagine we have a box sitting on a surface. Now to the naked eye, these two surfaces look very smooth. But if we were to do a very extreme zoom, if we were to zoom in, the ground in fact would not look smooth. It would look fairly rough. So let me represent that with something like this. So, and we're talking at the microscopic level. So if we're looking at the microscopic level, this is what the ground looks like. The bottom of the box is going to have something similar. We'll use a different color to represent it. So the bottom of the box also has these rigid, jaggedy surfaces. 
So as you can see, the hills and valleys of the two materials have these little collision points. So let this represent the box and this represent the ground. Now, of course, when we look at the surfaces just at a distance, we don't see this. But if we were to look under heavy magnification, you would see these very aggressive uh, hills and valleys. So first of all, let's talk about the forces. One, the box is exerting a force down. And this would be the force of gravity of the box. According to the third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The ground would be applying an equal but opposite force upward. And that is what is known as the normal force. So the normal force that our box experiences comes from the action-reaction force between the ground. So notice the forces are only happening in the y-axis at this point. There's no x-axis until we apply a force in the forward direction. So let's say a force is being applied to our box in the forward direction. What that implies is now we're going to get collisions at all of these points where the two surfaces interact. So we get a mini collision here. We get a mini collision here. And at every single point of interaction, we have a collision. Now, according to the third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What this means is that at every point of collision, the ground's going to push back and attempt to match an equal but opposite force. In this circumstance, what we have collectively here is a stalemate. The system is not going to accelerate. And that's because for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction that is occurring here. So this is the reason why when you push on an object, it will not necessarily move. This would be our applied force. And this would be our force of friction. As you can imagine, the more intense these hills and valleys are, the more intense the force of friction is. The deeper the grooves, the stronger the force of friction. The smoother the surfaces, the less friction we have. This stalemate happens up to a point until the applied force is so strong that we effectively force the box to slide over top of these hills. And what this means is that when we look at these little bumps here, there is going to have to be an upward motion in order to get over top of these. This explains the sensation that when you push an object and slide it across the floor, you can actually feel the vibration of these bounces that are happening at the microscopic level. You can hear them too. You can hear the sound of a box sliding across the table. And the more friction there is, the louder that sound is. The less friction there is, the quieter it is. And this has to do with these hills and valleys. So that upward motion, that vibration, that bouncing, that's what accounts for the sound that we get and the total amount of friction that we experience as well. So the force of friction has to do with how strong this coupling is. And that's why the formula for the force of friction is this. The force of friction is equal to mu times Fn, mu being this coefficient that we're talking about. Now, notice it didn't talk about the weight. It talked about the normal force because it's about how strong the two things are combined. And um, the weight of the object is not the whole story. For example, we could be pushing down on this box as well. And that would actually cause a greater downward force, which means that the normal force is larger. And we saw that in a previous video as well. If we isolate for mu, mu is equal to the ratio of the force of friction over Fn. Well, in this case, this force of friction is going to be equivalent to this applied force. And that's actually how mathematically or experimentally, I should say, we can actually find these mu values. The rougher the surface, the rougher the surface, the larger the mu value will be. And the reason why is that this force of friction, the value for this force of friction will be larger because these hills and valleys will be steeper. And as a final note, when we take a look at the interaction at these points where the hills and valleys meet each other, the other thing that's going to happen is over time, these little hills and valleys are going to get shaved off. And this is what we know colloquially as wear and tear. So as the materials rub against each other, that's when you start seeing like the little wear marks coming off. For example, when you erase something, you see bits of eraser marks. When you, when you do sanding, there's bits of wood and the sandpaper itself breaks down a bit. Um, these are all consequences of this friction rubbing against each other. Eventually, when the two surfaces rub, the, the surfaces wear down and become smoother. And there is a prime example of this. If you ever have the opportunity to go to the Vatican, there's a statue of St. Peter's. And the foot 
looks like this. Now, obviously, it never intended to look like this. The foot was quite detailed. So it's causing this wear and tear. And there's the culprit. For centuries, people have been rubbing the foot for good luck. And literally, the friction interaction between the hand and the marble eventually smoothed it down to this much. And that's part of the reason why when you visit these sites, these sites of antiquities, you're not allowed to touch the things because a single individual touch won't do any significant damage. Thousands upon thousands of touches over the decades will eventually generate damage like this. Okay, so let's take a look at a few examples here. So what we've got is the formula here. Force of friction is equal to mu fn. Now these mu values have to be found experimentally. So these are just a small list of some more common ones, but these all can be found experimentally. So let's do an example. Let's find the force of friction between a 1200 kilogram car and a concrete road. So there are two forces of friction that we have to consider. So let's do the mu static first. So drawing the free body diagram, at the moment, there would only be two forces acting on the object, on the vehicle specifically. We have the normal force and the force of gravity. Technically, there is no friction until there is some applied force. And then the force of friction will grow to try to meet the demand of the applied force. So in the static friction, the maximum static friction is equal to the maximum force that we can apply before the system starts to slip. So let's find force of friction static at its maximum. Well, force of friction is equal to mu s times fn. So what we have to do is we have to find fn. f net y is equal to fn plus fg. f net y is going to equal to zero. And why? Car is not floating or sinking. The normal is positive. Force of gravity is negative and it's equal to mg. So fn equals mg after we skip a couple of steps. So let's sub two into one. And that gives us force of friction is equal to mu s mg. So we need to find this value from mu s. So when we look at the table, rubber on concrete, 0.1 is the static, 0.18 is the kinetic. 1.0 times 1200 times 9.8. And that works out to 11,760 newtons. Therefore, the maximum static force of friction is equal to 11,760 newtons. Now that's maximum. So let's give a couple of scenarios. What if Fa equals only 5,000 newtons? In this case, the force of friction static would equal 5,000 newtons as well. What if the force applied was equal to 10,000 newtons? Therefore, the force of static friction will also equal 10,000 newtons. What if the force applied is exactly equal to 11,760 newtons? The force of static friction will equal that, but that amount is the final limit. Now, if Fa is greater than 11,760 newtons, friction now breaks. Friction now breaks and force of friction static converts into force of friction kinetic. So now let's explore that. So now let's find the force of friction kinetic. So the force of friction kinetic is equal to mu k times fn, which is equal to mu k mg after we sub in equation 2. So that value is 0 0.8. 0 0.8 times 1200 times 9.8. The friction would therefore drop immediately to only 9,408 newtons. What would happen to the car? All right. So consider if fa was equal to 11,760 newtons, force of friction static would hold at 11,760 newtons. Therefore, acceleration would be equal to zero meters per second squared. And the reason why is F net X would be equal to the applied force plus the force of friction static. So that'd be plus FA minus the force of friction static. That's 11,760 minus 11,760, zero newtons. But if the force applied just ever so slightly was greater than 11,000, um, 11,760 newtons, i.e. 11,760.0000001 newtons. Force of friction static would break and force of friction kinetic would kick in. Therefore, F net in the X component 
would equal to the applied force plus the force of friction kinetic, which would be positive FA, minus force friction kinetic, which would be our 11,760.0000001 newtons minus, and that is the important part, 9,408, which is roughly equal to, so F net equals MA, A is equal to F net over M, the car would accelerate at 1.96 meters per second squared. And that's basically how that works. If you have any questions, you can follow up with me on Microsoft Teams, or you can simply send me an email. Keep paying attention to D2L for future videos.